Ketterman, Library Director, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our third presentation of the spring 2018 season of the Medical History Interest Group. Our MHIG presentations are sponsored by the Loftus Library History Collections and the Department of Bioethics and Interdisciplinary Studies. I want to ask that any student attending the presentation who's here as part of the ECU Wellness Passport Program to please see Lane Carpenter after the program for your stamp. <laughs> and I'd also like to mention that our final presentation of the spring lecture series is on April 9th. Uh, the topic is the history of PTSD, how cultural narratives affect the patient experience. And the presenter for that lecture is uh, Sheena M. Egan, who is assistant professor in the Department of Bioethics and Interdisciplinary Studies. And also, um, for a little self-promotion, uh, here in the library, we encourage you to check out our current exhibits, including Understanding the Heart, A Brief History, that's located near the main entrance on the second floor. And then here on the fourth floor, we have Fighting for Their Lives, Medical Practices During the American Civil War, and then today's pop-up exhibit to complement Dr. Humphrey's presentation. And thank you to our colleagues at the Country Doctor Museum for installing that today. So it is now my pleasure to introduce you to Margaret. She is the Josiah Charles Trent Professor in the History of Medicine at Duke University. Her PhD in the History of Science and her medical degree are both from Harvard University. And she is the author of the following four texts, Yellow Fever and the South, published in 1992, Malaria, Poverty, Race, and Public Health in the United States, published in 2001, Intensely Human, the Health of the Black Soldier in American Civil War in 08, and then her 2013 book, Marrow of Tragedy, the Health Crisis of the American Civil War. She teaches the history of medicine, public health, global health, food, and biology to the undergraduates at Duke University, and is editor emeritus of the Journal of the History of Medicine. Please, with no further ado, let's welcome Margaret. Thank you. The, the librarians in the audience might be amused by this story. So Marrow of Tragedy comes out in 2013. It's up on Amazon. And so you look at it on the page. It says down there that list of things you might also be interested in. And it had this book on Civil War medicine, that book on Civil War medicine, and a box of marrow bone dog biscuits. <laughs> I am so sorry I didn't get a screenshot because somebody corrected it. But uh, anyway, their, their little search and connect didn't quite work. Anyway, so um, today I want to talk about Civil War medicine, obviously, and this question of diversity. And the thing that I want to emphasize is that not all Civil War soldiers had the same experience when it comes to health. And there are three categories, and your chances were much better depending on which category you were in. So let me just make sure this works. Did that go? Okay. So I'm going to give you some statistics. Um, you know, historians have footnotes. I have a book. You may consult it as well. This is a reproduction. There's the, the old version. This is the new reprint version. Medical and surgical statistics, so the history of the Civil War. And they go on and on and on and on and on. And if you don't like my statistics, you're welcome to do it yourself. Um, the, they were great gatherers of statistics in the war. The North better than the South, for reasons we'll talk about. But still, um, this is the first war in American history that was, whose health was, and disease and mortality was so well tabulated. So we know something like 700,000 people died, soldiers died in the war. This keeps changing and people find new reasons to change the number. That's the little tilde in front of it. Um, two thirds of those deaths were from disease. Uh, and the other third were battlefield deaths or deaths closely related to a wound on the battlefield. And while there are disparities here, they're not the principal focus of my talk, although I will talk about that somewhat. Now this is sort of the central slide of the talk. And with the lighting, it's a little hard to see, I'm sorry to say. But I'll block some of this light. Um, so probably here, I don't have to explain that CSA is Confederate States of America. 
USA white troops, and USCT is US colored troops, which was their official designation. A tenth of the Union Army was black by the time they'd enrolled all those men from 1863 to 1865. Now, and this is how it was reported, deaths from disease per thousand men. Um, I've been taken to task by an epidemiologist saying this is not how we do it. And I say, I can give you the book. This is how they did it, okay? I don't have anything else. Um, the Confederate data you see is from 1862 and 1863. That's actually not from this book. It's from documents created, articles created by a surgeon named Joseph Jones who used the Confederate Medical Department's records to come up with these statistics. Um, so Confederates died of disease in those two years, 167 per thousand men. White troops for the whole span, 61 to 65, 53 per thousand. And black troops are in, in between 143 per thousand. Now, you might think all Civil War medicine was so bad that they should have all died the same. What made this difference? And I hope you're starting to think about how these populations might be different how 62, 63 only may be different from 61 to 65, and how these black troops might have been different. Um, so that's where I started, that's what I wanted to think about. And it wasn't just me. The um, people who wrote this whole series of books, in the eight, compiled them in the 1880s, had a whole section on this disparity. What, because they too were fascinated by what they knew. Now the reason there's no data beyond 1863 for Confederate disease, anybody know? If we were in Richmond, somebody would pop up and say, Oh, we, they burned Richmond. They burned Richmond. Just like they burned Atlanta, they set off the powder magazines and the, the storage of gunpowder in the city and it caught the city on fire. The, confi the, um, the Confederates who were retreating wanted to deny the Union troops their gunpowder, so they ended up burning the city. So with that went the warehouse and all the storage of all that paper that uh, was lost. And Washington, D.C., the National Archives, was built on all that paper uh, when um, that was left over from the war, the huge volume of record keeping. So. Fortunately, Joseph Jones wrote up these summary things in 1863 or we wouldn't even have that. So, now. So if I'm going to say that doctors made a difference or medicine made a difference, then what did the Civil War doctor have that was of any use at all? First of all, there were some drugs that made a difference. Quinine, and you know, not everybody knows that malaria was a major problem in the United States. Uh, in the mid-19th century. It was particularly a problem in the South. This part of North Carolina, coastal South Carolina, um, Florida, and Louisiana, the Mississippi River Delta. Uh, malaria did a number on U.S. Grant's troops as he was laying siege to Vicksburg. So malaria was an important disease in the war for not just killing people, but knocking them down, putting them in bed. Um, and quinine is an effective drug. It is a drug with a lot of side effects, but compared to dying, for example, it's a tolerable drug. Um, opiates were available already in the war in a variety of means. There was laudanum liquid opiate. There was injected morphine. Um, and opiates could both obviously make a big difference for pain and for diarrhea. Uh, certainly the old fashioned uh, treatment for that. There was a, a drug I don't know how many people here have hair gray enough to match mine and uh, age, but when I was a child, the treatment for diarrhea was a drug called paragoric, which tasted horrible, but you put sugar on a spoon and poured the paragoric on. It was an opiate compound. Uh, it shut up the kids, too. They'd stop complaining. Um, and there were anesthetics in the war. Now, how many of you think they had I just told you they did, but before this would have said there, were no, there was no anesthesia in the Civil War. How many people think that? You're none of you going to admit it. 
87% of people who went through a, an exhibit at the Mutter Library in, Wash in um, Philadelphia about Civil War medicine said there was no anesthetics in the war, in part probably because they'd seen Gone with the Wind. And <laughs> there's that scene where Scarlet runs screaming away or, you know, panicking away from operations without anesthetic. And there may not have been enough anesthetics at the Fairgrounds Hospital in Atlanta because it was a siege situation. They were surrounded and they may have used up the supplies. But most of the time in the war, there was ether and there was chloroform north and south. Controlling that, knowing how to use that, that was important. They had vaccination against smallpox, although it's a very complicated story in the war about how they used that. And if anybody's interested, I could elaborate. But it did help control the spread of that disease, say, compared to the American Revolution. Um, surgery, the, uh, you know, the starting slide, the, the image of Civil War medicine is the surgeon with the hacksaw enough that you can make a cartoon that this is Civil War medicine. Well, amputations were very important for saving lives. The um, yes men died from infections after them, but 75% of the major amputations, a leg amputation, an arm amputation, survived. And so they were right to do it, and they did it particularly after a battle as fast as they could go. Um, because they knew you had 48 hours if there was a mini ball that had gone through the skin, carrying the filthy uniform with it into a bone, they had 48 hours before infection set in. They had to get that limb off. So the um, pictures you've seen, piles of limbs, whatnot, they were going quickly, but they were using anesthesia. Um, they did not know about antiseptic surgery and they had no antibiotics, but the body I, I like to point this out to medical students. The body can heal without antibiotics. We didn't have any antibiotics till World War II, essentially, so this is, this is possible. Physicians who could organize rapid field evacuation, whether a man who's wounded lies on a field for 48, 72 hours without somebody getting him, or is gotten off quickly, has his bleeding controlled, somebody starts giving him fluids. This makes a difference. And then hygienic hospital care, which I'll come back to but if you could get to a general hospital, the big organized hospitals with beds that were away from the front lines, the mortality rate was only something like one to 5% if you could get there. I mean, it's really a survivor survive kind of situation, but the care those hospitals had to offer mattered. Um, and then the question of nutritious food. And I'll come back to, that's just on the list. Um, we'll come back to it. So plan for the talk, I want to talk about each of these factors somewhat, some big, some little, looking for differences among these three groups, white northern troops, black northern troops, and confederate troops. And um, before we start, I want to think about this in a sense as a clinical trial. Are they, if those of you who think about clinical trials know that you want the two arms to be equal in various traits, age, predisposing conditions, the rest of it. So let's think about whether they did enter that way, and then I'll draw some grand conclusions. Okay, all right, health upon enrollment. Um, the, much has to do with exposure to childhood diseases. Now, why do you think some troops would have more exposure to childhood diseases than others? Crowded cities, okay. Um, I'm, I'm looking around the room assessing age. Um, how many of you had measles as a child? How many of you had mumps as a child? How many of you had chicken pox as a child? How about German measles as a child? Hi. You you know, in, in the, it doesn't take much, I grew up in a town with 10,000 people, but we had parties to spread all these diseases. I'm 62. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody got all those things. They're about the only vaccination I got was smallpox. I don't think um, as I got into medical care, they boosted some of my immunity. But, but so we people who grew up around all these diseases developed immunity and kept developing it. It's not only that you had chicken pox, 
but then your little sister had chicken pox, and then your cousin had chicken pox, and every time you got re-exposed, it was like being vaccinated again. So people who live in a culture with all those disease circulating go into adulthood immunized, whereas if you live in a rural community, those diseases may come sporadically or not at all. And so the United States was, had quite different neighborhoods, if you will, of this sort. The cities obviously had a lot of exposure. The um, rural slaves who may have been fairly limited in how they could travel may have had none. People living in sparsely populated areas, be it in Illinois or in Mississippi, may not have been exposed either. So um, the one, one scholar has followed a New York regiment who was from upstate New York, I don't know, somewhere south of Buffalo, I think. And he felt that probably most of those guys went into the war without any of these exposures. And he, his calculation was it took them about nine months. Either you got immunized to all those things by being exposed to them, or maybe you died of measles pneumonia, which is a real problem in, in adult people. Um, but the, they had to run through all sorts of things and either get used to them or go home, you know. Um, so there would have been, on the Union side, more cities, more people who started out immunized, and they would have gone in very well nourished. And so Union white soldiers are going to beat um, Confederate soldiers in this regard. By beat, I mean be stronger in this regard and certainly better than the black troops, who 75% of them were ex-slaves and had not been ex-slaves very long before they went into the army. Okay, environmental effects. The South had diseases which would have weakened the Southern troops from childhood on. One was malaria, both falciparum, far enough south, and vivax. Malaria stunts the growth of children. Hookworm is another disease that causes chronic anemia in children and stunts their growth. And many Civil War soldiers were carrying hookworms in their intestines on enrollment. Hookworm, though, doesn't like cold weather. So you don't get hookworm, say, much north of the uh, North Carolina line going into Virginia. As soon as you get in Virginia, the hookworms say, we're out of here, we're going back south. But, I mean, it, it has to do with sandy soils and temperature. There's a whole environmental gradient about it. Um, and the, um, so those people, everything else being equal, would have gone into the war more weak. Um, the black slaves who were on southern plantations were equally exposed to those sorts of problems, although they had some hereditary benefit that helped fight malaria. We can talk more about their interest in the general poverty of the South, particularly the yeoman South, the non-big slave-holding South, would have also fueled this, that uh, um, they would have had poor nutrition in childhood. We know the slaves had poor nutrition in childhood. Um, so that would have benefited. The Union whites, again, would have gone in healthier than the Confederacy and then the slaves. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Stop me at any point if you want to comment or challenge or question. Okay, yes, sir. The hookworm disease would have also been a failure of public health because people stepped out into the woods to dip. So, all right, a couple of points about that. Yes, you get hookworm because human feces from a person with hookworm have, are on the ground that barefoot children are walking around on, usually children more than adults. Um, they didn't know any of that in the 1850s, 1860s. That's really not figured out until after 1900. Um, but yes, the whole concept, people, let's just say, I was in Massachusetts for spring break this year, and I didn't see a single person going barefoot in the snow. Going barefoot is not a northern thing, okay? Whereas my daddy growing up in West Tennessee, son of a dentist, prosperous family, they didn't see any point in the boy having shoes in the summer. So going barefoot is a southern thing, and for children to go barefoot is a southern thing. And having latrines rather than 
water closets came much later in the South. Um, my mother's family from Minnesota ended up in East Tennessee as part of a TVA project. And the TVA built houses for the imported workers, but the local kids, this is the Watts Bar Dam and where the Watts Bar Power Plant is, um, they, they had no indoor plumbing. They might have a pump with water. So, you know, latrines are latrines and they can soil the ground. So yes, to say it's a public health failure implies somebody even knew that this was a problem. It was just more common in the South. It's tied both to environment and poverty. So yes, there was, I'm told, there was a point in time in, when baseball announcers would talk about the hookworm belt, meaning that uh, some player had come from the South. Uh, the uh, hookworm was so identified with this part of the world. Isn't it also southern sleeping sickness? Southern sleeping sickness? Don't they call hookworm disease southern sleeping sickness? I had not heard that. And the reason that they call the Confederate veterans old, grizzled soldiers, because they were in their teens I'm not sure hookworm would make you grizzled. It would make you <laughs> anemic. Yeah. Um, they looked much older than their age would indicate. I see. Well, I don't know. I'll just say that. Um, now, let's see. We're going to see a cartoon of two southern soldiers, which may uh, support that argument. Okay, so the, you might think that the black troops in the North were, should have had the same environmental care, if you will, of the Army as the Southern, but they were, ne I mean, as the whites, but they were never treated as equals, although it got better toward the end of the war. They got lower pay at the start, and it's sort of a joke to say they had bad food and there wasn't enough of it, um, but they were not fed enough and it was very poor quality. The quartermaster tended to reissue them tents that had been turned in by white units as worn out. And so the tents had holes in them, the clothing was shabby, they got poor quality firearms, their guns didn't shoot. I mean, I'm talking about being unclear on the concept of what's the point of even giving, giving them these. But the, um, most of the officers, almost all the officers in black units were white. Some of them were men of great dedication, like Robert Gould Shaw in the Massachusetts 54th, but most of them were there to be officers, to get the pay, to get the promotion, to get the pension. They were not there because they had strong abolitionist uh, tendencies and they often did not treat their men well. Um, you may be familiar with the concept of social capital, but these men could not self-advocate very well. Most of them were illiterate. They couldn't write letters home. Um, if some guy in the Illinois 22nd was being badly treated by his officers, their hospitals were horrid and whatnot, he could write mama. And mama could talk to the mayor of whatever little Illinois town that came from. And most of the men in the Mass 22nd probably came within 20 miles of that county seat. And that mayor might have a chat with the governor and that commander of that unit might hear about it. In other words, there's, in all these letters home with Phil libraries, there's a chain of literacy and of influence that black troops could never even approximate because most of them couldn't write. And they couldn't get help unless somebody else advocated for them, which they did a few times. Um, now, the South had much less access to drugs than the North. Um, and I'll just move ahead to this slide and then I'll back up. You're probably familiar with this cartoon. This was Winfield Scott's plan. We're going to blockade the South. Um, it was initially quite porous. It, um, the Confederacy often captured the supply trains of Union uh, armies because the South was doing pretty well in 1861-62 and they got a lot of stuff that way. Of course, you're familiar with the blockade runners going into Charleston, into New Bern. Um, and they brought in um, needed things. Um, this particular border between uh, Kentucky and the Northwest, um, 
there were you know a lot of mixed sentiments in that area so it's not like it was instantly good but as the war went on the blockade got stronger now one of the reasons like if you think of Rhett Butler taking his blockade runner down to Bahamas and bringing things back Rhett Butler did not want to get paid in Confederate paper money he wanted gold and the people in Bermuda or the Bahamas wanted gold because everybody knew Confederate money was rapidly declining in value so the, the Confederacy had this plan at the start of the war, some of you may know this, that they would sequester the cotton. And if, if the English couldn't get cotton for the Manchester and Liverpool mills, that the English would come in on the side of the Confederacy. They called it the cotton famine. So they held on to their cotton, but that meant they didn't get the money from England. And that money, that gold, you know, it's supposed to be backing the currency. The whole system never worked because of that. And besides all that gold is buried in a field in western Pennsylvania and the FBI has it now or some, anyway, never mind. Um, so that by 1864, they could not bring much in by the blockade runners bringing medicines, for example. And quinine is something that I particularly followed because it treats malaria. And we see quinine shortages in Richmond hospitals, in the, the, the record books of hospitals in Columbia, South Carolina, and in Charleston, South Carolina, which was a hotbed area of malaria. They didn't begin to have enough quinine. The quinine they have listed on their books as available is enough for maybe two weeks, and it's covering the whole year. Um, and there's some evidence from data, again, it's scattered, that um, people weren't dying of malaria in the South because of it, uh, soldiers in hospitals. Um, other shortages in opiates, ether, and chloroform get worse as the war goes on. So that is one factor that was important. And there's his great snake again. Now, I'm very fond of cartoons because cartoons tell you what everybody knows. They're not funny if everybody doesn't know it. So here we have two old before their time Confederate troops, skinny, poorly clad. Now this is a northern depiction. Obviously it's from Harper's Weekly, but already in 1862. And one says to the other, and this is the mountains of West Virginia. Awful, what would become West Virginia? Awful cold, ain't it? Second picket, cold, yes. And I'm just getting another shake of that agar and no quinine in the Federacy. Agar's a word for malaria, ague, um, and he doesn't have any quinine. Worser still, I got them blue devils after me and nary a drop of whiskey. Now, not many people know that Coach K had a role in the Civil War. <laughs> I love that joke. And when I gave it at Dartmouth, nobody laughed. <laughs> what are the blue devils here? Anybody know? What would whiskey cure? DTs, the alcohol withdrawal, you know, the pink elephants. So I guess, I mean, we supposedly pink elephants are what you see in the modern day. Blue devils, I guess, are what drunks saw who didn't have access to whiskey before. So I wish I was home. Um, they, don't, they argued over apples that were growing in North Carolina and making brandy from them because the army, the doctors wanted the brandy to give to patients and the troops wanted the brandy to give to the troops. And you know, there was, you see this increasingly in the South, discussion of shortages. Um, so this is just the stats on malaria. The union case mortality from malaria is half a percent maybe. Um, and that the big Confederate hospital in Richmond, the mortality 6.2%. Um, and Chimborazo being further, being in Virginia, and cases from Virginia largely would have mostly Vivax malaria, which is milder. We don't have any data at all for South Carolina, Louisiana, the areas that would have had falciparum malaria, which can have 30% mortality rate compared to much lower rates for Vivax. So, um, again, I'm 
constantly defending my stats. This is what I have. You can find some more. Great. I'm glad to see them. Uh, now, I said I wasn't going to talk much about surgery, but I want to mention it. Um, this is a drawing of an amputation, obviously. The person who did the drawing is the person on the table. Obviously not at the same time, but in his recovery period, he did all this sketching of his wound. He drew his operation, he drew his leg as a separate thing after it got cut off. But you can see the surgeons are dressed in their regular uniforms. Their hands are just their hands. There's no gloves. This is, it's a little hard to tell. That's the hole in his leg and that's his pants leg that's been cut away. He's been wearing that uniform probably for three months. He's been sleeping in it. He's been lying in a muddy cow pasture to shoot somebody with it. Um, and so the wound that has gone through just below his knee is full of all those germs and all that bacteria and they're about to cut it off. But also notice the rag over his face. That's almost certainly chloroform. Ether is too hard to transport and very flammable, but chloroform is easier for this sort of field hospital that he's getting operated on in. So. Can I ask a question about the chloroform? Because I'm, I'm one of the people who didn't realize there was. All right, good. Somebody confesses up. Okay. Um, how did they know how much to use? This is an excellent question. Do we have any anesthesiologists, surgeons here who could talk about? Oh, good. Okay, then I'll be uh, the expert. Um, so the challenge with anesthesia is you want the person to sleep. Some of you may have had this so-called conscious sedation at the dentist office. They don't. They want you to be asleep but still breathing because they're not set up to intubate to put the tube down for breathing. Well, of course, they hadn't even invented yet the concept of putting a tube down to breathe. So they were trying to get them asleep enough, but not stop the breathing. And so they put it on until the person seemed to go to sleep, and they just lift it up. And if the person starts to respond, they put it back down. I think it's, it's just very empirical. And the guys are going as fast as possible. You can realize how many limbs they're cutting off. Um, so the operation is not going to last very long. Yes, sir? They tried to titrate it. They would drop it and speak to the person. Mm. As soon as they heard the vocal drop. Oh, okay. All right. Um, that, uh, that guy does not have any kind of piece of equipment, whereas I think somewhere over in this exhibit, there's actually a kind of mask that they'd use that with. He just has a handkerchief. So, but no antibiotics, no antisepsis. Um, the... Um, and getting them to this place, getting that wound controlled, getting it, get the bleeding stopped, all that matters. So I keep forgetting you don't have the next slide, which I have, which is always so handy. So you need good surgeons. Good surgeons are better than bad surgeons. That sounds like a dumb thing to say. Um, but the white troops in the north got the better surgeons because they got the first surgeons. The black troops weren't enlisted until 1863 by which point there weren't many doctors left to become surgeons for the black troops. And that's something I could talk more about. Um, the surgeons in the South and the surgeons in the North were probably pretty similar. Many of them trained at the University of Pennsylvania. When Chimborazo Hospital in Richmond, the huge hospital there, when it was surrendered, the, you know, the Union takes over Richmond and uh, the union surgeon that somebody's delegated to go take over Chimborazo. The guy who surrendered as head of the hospital surrendered to a classmate from the University of Pennsylvania. They'd studied with the same mentor and, and so forth. So, I mean, there's not, you can't say, oh, the Southern people were stupid. That doesn't work. The, um, and the, um, the surgeons learned fairly quickly. I mean, if you didn't know how to do an amputation, at the start of this day, you did by the end of it. And if this guy didn't know how to do anesthesia at 8 o'clock in the morning when he'd done his 15th case or 20th case, he, he did. So, I mean, doctors like to talk about see one, do one, teach one. This was a huge teaching experience. 
Um, and then post-op care was extremely important and that pushes us to that point about hygienic hospital care. So the kind of hospital I'm talking about here is the so-called general hospitals. These were hospitals behind the lines. This is not a hospital at risk of being overrun by the opposition, although eventually the hospital in Richmond was, but um, we've got uh, Satterley Hospital in Philadelphia and Chimborazo in Richmond. Chimborazo is a, a mountain in Bolivia somewhere. The hill was named Chimborazo before the hospital was, although somebody else told me that the quinine tree grows on the Chimborazo Mountain in Bolivia. So you can, whatever theory you like. Um, so look at these things. These are long sheds and there's a nice photograph down on that wall that shows the inside. The sheds were maybe, oh this is a nice size room, about as big side to side as this space. So if you imagine a a bed here, and a bed here, and a stove in the middle if it gets cold wherever you are, then that's the width of the hospital. But the length of the hospital is maybe like you put two double wides end to end, um, or two, you know, trailers end to end. The idea is that, and there are windows, and the idea is air and light. This is Florence Nightingale's pavilion system of hospitals that uh, both sides embraced as the, the way to build a hospital. Lots of light, lots of air. They didn't know about germs, but they knew that these things made for better healing. Um, now Satterley and Chimborazo could both hold about 5,000 patients. And the, you know, the thing that impresses me, now I don't know what how the response time is in the emergency room of the hospital here. I know in Duke Hospital that once somebody is going to be admitted, we're definitely going to admit them, they're gonna to go to this kind of bed, you wait 12 hours for the bed to be available because there's just, the, the limit of course is nursing care. Um, not the, the physical bed, but the nurse to go with it. On the other hand, Satterley got almost 2,000 patients from Gettysburg. They came, you know, within a few days. The guy at Chimborazo or some of the other hospitals at Richmond could hear that you need to send out 250 patients because you're getting in 250 patients tomorrow. I mean, this rapid turnover, one of the ways they did that, you can see here and maybe see it a little better there, they had tents. They could rapidly expand their bedding through tents. Tents sound kind of primitive but when they got outbreaks of gangrene, they would so-called go under canvas. They'd move the gangrene patients out away from the general population so that whatever evil miasmas were rising off their bodies would stop making other people sick. So the tents had a variety of uses. They also put smallpox patients out there who they knew would be contagious. Um, of those people that got to Satterley from Gettysburg, a tiny percent, probably fewer than 20, died. So if they could get there, they did well. Now one of the reasons they did well had to do with who was in those hospitals. Now this is the northern situation. Um, and I know it's hard to see, but this label here says our heroines. Um, now the nurses in Satterley looked like that upper right corner and those of you who are my age or older probably remember the flying nun with her, her headdress that she could supposedly fly with. It's, this is the Sisters of Charity. A lot of northern hospitals had, were in places with a large Catholic population and had nursing orders who could uh, come and help out in the hospital. Other places there were uh, women who volunteered or women who actually got hired and paid and became part of the nursing corps. Dorothea Dix um, famously organized the nursing corps in the north. She said she just wanted women who were 30 or over plain and not there to look for a husband, but to get down to work and be serious. Um, they, uh, I don't know how well she did on that, but, and, and they also did things like hire 
women to make pajamas for the men in the North. They'd hire uh, young adult women who didn't have jobs. They'd, the philanthropists would set up sewing machines and they'd do things like that. So this is actually a picture that's, that's praising the United States Sanitary Commission, which was sort of a Red Cross group. It was run by men, but it was staffed by women and really funneled all the patriotic fervor of women in the North into caring for the men. In the hospital, having sanitary fairs where they raise money for the troops in the hospital, sewing clothing, as I said, and then organizing uh, clothing, and then directly on the battlefield. There was one point when um, Ulysses S. Grant's army in Tennessee had exhausted the food in the countryside around his camp, and the men were getting scurvy. And the call went to Chicago, a telegram went to the Sanitary Commission in Chicago and said, Grant needs scurvy preventing foods, anti-scorbutics. They didn't know about vitamin C, but they knew what foods mattered. And they didn't have many oranges and lemons in Chicago, Illinois, but they connected to the heartland to get potatoes, which actually have a substantial amount of vitamin C in them. Um, various things like onions and cabbage. These strange German people who had not so long ago moved into the Midwest, they took their cabbage and they put it in vinegar and they called it, and it's interesting to see all the way sauerkraut could be spelled. Um, but, so these sorts of foods, turnips, carrots, parsnips, anything, were funneled down to the Chicago office, put on boats, sent south to get to Grant's army. So the Sanitary Commission could organize that sort of thing. Um, now, I like the woman's gaze in this picture, and I want you to think about what a nurse could do in a hospital if she cared about the patient. Now, she could call the doctor and say, he just passed out. She could get him something to drink. She could wash his forehead. She could wash him in general. Um, or notify whoever's supposed to clean him up if the omnipresent symptom of diarrhea um, should show itself. And think about having an amputated leg and having diarrhea and lying in a bed and being immobile. And she could also help him eat. The, now, I don't know how many of you have had the experience I had with my mother in her declining years. She'd be in the hospital for something, I'd come in and she hadn't touched, she had a lunch on a tray, all right, but she hadn't touched it and she didn't like it and she was kind of dozing and I'm like, mother, you've got to eat some of this. I don't want any of this. Can you go get me some ice cream or get me some pudding or get me, I don't know, whatever she wanted. She wanted me to go to Dairy Queen and get what she called a flippo, which was one of these kind of soft serve things with stuff stirred into it. But my point is that someone who cared can get food into the patient Whereas if nobody's paying attention, they just take the tray away after a while. And you've probably, I don't know if you've cared for elderly relatives, but it's very common. So all those things, an attentive caregiver makes a difference. Um, now, the other things that are controlled by doctors or by medicine is rest, the ability to stay in your tent when you're tired, um, to, to Go on leave, go on furlough if you're ill and, and they let you go home. The, um, the U.S. colored troops were often denied this. They believed the kind of rhetoric the Union people did that the black troops are lazy and they're, they're like slaves, they're going to lie, they're, they're going to try to get out of work. Um, and the, that CSA is a typo. It should be the fact that the U.S. colored troops were in great demand. They did a lot of the labor for the Union Army. They built barracks. They were put in place to build up forts or build uh, protective barriers. They were often, you know, put in that position to do the work and they were wanted. Um, the um, cleanliness of the hospitals varied greatly across these three groups. Um, in the Union with those white women paying attention to the white troops and pushing for hospital quality of care, it's going to be better than for the black troops who don't have that kind of attentive 
female attendance by and large. In the Confederacy, 75% of the people who worked in hospitals were slaves. So think about that dynamic. Think about all the ways a slave could, the, the likely animosity of the slave toward this Confederate soldier who's in bed, who is fighting to keep that man a slave or that woman a slave. And while they would do their duty as ordered, they might not do it to the degree that the caring northern white woman might do. Um, I'm not sure I would want my enemy being my nurse. But of course, Southerners would have said, oh, they're not our enemies. They all love us. Well, maybe so. Um, the, um, and this whole point about social networking depends on literacy. Now, the most important issue, though, I think, for the differential in mortality between white and white, white union, white confederacy, is food. And it's not an exaggeration to say the South lost the war because of food. It's the first thing Robert E. Lee asked for when he surrendered at Appomattox. Um, he could not go on. You can't go on if your men are so starved. And it got to that point. Now, what happened to the food? Well, in Virginia, for example, where so much of the war was fought, they trampled over the agricultural land. They burned the fences that kept the animals in place. Um, they raided the barns, both sides, raided the stored hams and things like that that were in barns uh, from the locals. Sometimes they paid for it, sometimes they didn't. Um, their money was of shrinking value. People in North Carolina, um, the there were, you know, a lot of food being produced in this area and people who had access to the sounds and boats, they would rather get to the union lines and sell their food for union money than to sell their food to the Confederacy. And they did it that way. I mean, <coughs> you're not giving all that work away. Um, and men in hospitals couldn't do the foraging that men in troop units could do. Um, the men in Richmond hospitals, we're told, were reduced to a diet of peas and cornbread and not much of that. So there's a diary of a woman named Phoebe Pember who was sort of a matron in, a, in Chimborazo Hospital. And she was kind of an administrator, if you will. And she s talked about how in the kitchen they'd make a big pan out of cornmeal and smushed up peas, like field peas, crowder peas. Um, and they'd spread it all out in the pan and they'd cook it. And then they'd say, how many men do we have to feed? And that's how many squares they cut out of this pan for this food that was available. Um, and in one of her famous quotes, epicures sometimes manage to entrap rats and secure a nice broil for supper, declaring their flesh was superior to squirrel meat. Well, now, if that's your standard, well, this is Eastern Carolina, and they did. <laughs> you know, talk about Brunswick stew and all the rest of it. And then she gives the recipe. They skinned it and cut his head off and basted it. Where they got bacon fat, I don't know. And uh, said it tasted like Kansas back ducks. So aside from the whole question of the farmland being destroyed, the South was not a food producing region by and large. The South was in the business of making cash crops. Cotton to the doors of the cabins, as they said. If you've read the Empire of Cotton book, you know how enormously profitable growing cotton was leading up to the Civil War. And you, but you can't eat cotton or tobacco or some of the other crops that, uh, like indigo, the, uh, there was some corn grown, and, of course, but what they really did is buy their food from the Midwest, ship it down the Mississippi River, the Ohio River, and so forth. So the, um, that's a major reason. The second is that the Union Army encroached on the South, and farms were ravaged by war as uh, Union troops took what little food was left. But people certainly couldn't be growing their ordinary thing, and they'd lost their, their breed animals. You're not going to get a new calf or a cow with milk, even if you don't have your, your bull and you don't, you, know, you don't have your mama cow. So that was a huge problem. 
Joseph Jones again talked about how in 1864 they started seeing secondary hemorrhage, pyemia, and hospital gangrene. What he's talking about is scurvy in the hospitals. You get secondary hemorrhage when a wound opens, and they saw that not only in Confederate prisoners in hospitals in the Confederacy, but also particularly at Andersonville. If a person had a wound, a scar, it would open up again because the collagen broke down that had held that wound together. And they, that's the secondary hemorrhage, the infections. Um, as he said, the great battles of the expiring con Confederacy, it became more and more common. They couldn't feed the people in their hospitals. And they had all sorts of things they didn't have in those hospitals. You can see this in the record books. So some wiseacre in Richmond would tell them, go out in the woods and gather this herb and put it in bottles, make a tincture with alcohol, and put a cork in the bottle. And the guy would write patiently back, we don't have any bottles. We don't have any corks. The wagon axle just broke. And how the hell are we supposed to do this? Um, then they'd also send down things, stop wrapping the dead in sheets when you bury them. You see, they had to send their uniforms back to Richmond to be reused by somebody else. And so these men were naked and they were wrapping them in sheets, but the South didn't have enough sheets. The land of cotton didn't make fabric. That was for Manchester and Lowell and Lawrence to do. Um, the shortages to build hospitals, wood, canvas, all sorts of construction materials, nails. And then you read from a Columbia, South Carolina hospital that is there anywhere we can get our saws sharpened? Is there a saw sharpener left in Charleston? Think about that when you look at those kits over there. So, and they fought over slaves who could do labor of various sorts. Um, I'm running late. Okay. You also see the black troops being fed poorly. There's an outbreak of scurvy in Texas from the total malfeasance of their officers who were taking the money and buying liquor from the Mexicans and not feeding their troops. Um, they, uh, so incidents like that happened with them. So in summary, you can't draw sharp conclusions because the statistics are too weak. The health care that was available made a difference. There was such a thing as good health care in the Civil War and bad health care in the Civil War. The key factors were food, food, and more food. I love the, a letter from a, a kid who's from Indiana, who's at a hospital in Philadelphia from Satterley, and he writes home to Mama and says, I had an orange this week. Do you know what an orange is? He'd never seen one before. They had oranges. They had lemonade in Satterley. They were, you know, dying of scurvy in, in Richmond. Um, the Confederate deficits are really tied directly to the war situation. They knew what to do. They couldn't do anything about it. And black troops were mostly willfully neglected by their officers and their doctors. I have a whole book on that. You're welcome to find more. It's a grim story. Um, I always like to put them up to humanize the black troops and how hard they fought and how unnecessarily many of them died. And the, the sad fact is that even the Army did a, a study of why the black troops uh, die more than the white troops. And they said the black man was intrinsically weaker than the white man. Um, and there were people who protested about that, people who are my heroes. But that sort of idea lasts into the end of the 19th century at least. So I will stop there. And I'm happy to take questions. question and the answer on tape. I would like to bring this to various people. And I'd like to start with Dr. Collins and ask him, you know, you were talking about the uh, titrated chloroform, and that was not on, would not have been on the tape. So I'm going to ask you to uh, talk. I think it's more, a, uh, it's more a mechanical you know, gauge of how you're taking someone under. You mm. start titrating the anesthetic dosage and talk to the patient, and as soon as their voice drops, you know, you start easing up on your drip. 
Mm. Well, certainly there's the old-fashioned, I want you to count back from 10, 9, 8, and then, <coughs> then you wake up and your knee hurts like hell. <laughs> anyway, um, that's just my personal experience. Okay. <laughs> if you've not already done so, please sign the attendance sheet before you leave. We've got refreshments, and you're welcome to have, take them. Um, we also are having a reception for the opening exhibit uh, over there. And I saw a hand. Okay, well. Thank you. Could you say something briefly about the um, incidence of and the mortality of dysentery and diarrhea as a result of the troops eating green corn and unripe apples? Um, first of all, diarrheal illnesses were the most common disease in the war. I think it's far more likely that it was the bacteria in the water supply that they were drinking and contaminating than the green apples and the green corn. But they might have just eaten that when, I don't know, it could have caused indigestion and problems. But you realize that um, although there were people who knew how to set up a camp where, so that you got your water from here and you put what they called the sinks or the latrines over here. They put those overflowing water because they wanted they, this idea that, uh, as people have in all sorts of places in the world, if you build your latrines out over a water supply, it gets washed away and everything's clean. But um, that often, first of all, you're dealing with teenage boys. Now, I don't know about your exposure to teenage boys. Some of you were teenage boys once. Um, and many of these people had come from farm country where if during the day they had a call of nature, they went behind a bush, you know, it was just their thing. Um, and in the middle of the night, some of you may have dealt with, with scouts and having to get the guys to go off to the latrines rather than just go behind the tent because it's raining and it's cold and they don't want to do that. Um, so there was, these were not professional troops who had been drilled and convinced about hygiene. There were about 30,000 regular army troops at the start of the war and the, you know, two or three million served. And so getting the officers who were not trained to be officers, getting everybody on board with hygiene was one of the major problems of the war and one that the Sanitary Commission particularly kept pushing and kept saying, you've got to do this or you're going to contaminate your water supplies. They didn't know about germs, but they knew, they, they worried about organic material in the water as poisoning it somehow. So we can assume that there were viruses, bacteria, amoebae all spread through those means. Uh, Civil War hospitals particularly were developed just for you know, the purpose of you know, taking care of the wounded. But I was wondering if the, the two that you mentioned here, one in Richmond and one in uh, Philadelphia, if they were affiliated with other hospitals or were they precursors to uh, what exists now in those cities? Okay, I, I would add that, that they were for diseases as well as the wounded. Um, the, there are a lot of levels of hospitals. So, you know, every regiment had a tent with three or four cots in it for the uh, guy who's sick, you know, just while the regiment's camping out. And they built bigger sort of tent cities, say, at Gettysburg after the battle to take care of people. But the idea was to get them to these general hospitals, these large hospitals, if they didn't recover quickly. Even the regimental hospitals, if you went in with pneumonia and you just weren't getting better, they might ship you off, because the regiment may be ready to move and go somewhere. They'd ship you someplace else um, to get care. The hospitals disappeared after the war. Now, the Satterley, for example, had consultants from the Pennsylvania Hospital, the, you know, the great doctors, uh, the University of Pennsylvania um, and 
often some of the other hospitals also had those people helping out, consulting, um, walking the wards with their students. The students might be cadets in the hospital. So there would be connection there, but when the war is over, Satterley is sold off. It disappears. Um, there's a commemorative rock to it, but there's nothing left. Um, Chimborazo likewise disappeared. Richmond had just burned a big part of it. They needed lumber. Ch Chimborazo didn't burn. So all those pavilions are disassembled so people can build new housing um, elsewhere. So many more of the hospitals in the south were in existing buildings. Um, the, um, they took schools, they took tobacco warehouses, whatever, and they put beds in them. In the north, the, the, the hospitals that were created for the war disappeared after the war. Did, did the militaries recognize the need for medical providers and train them, or were these, by and large, just men who were already physicians, and when the war started, they practiced? So, I guess you're asking, when does the military start its own medical schools and so forth? Um, before the Civil War, for those 30,000 men, their, the positions to be in the Army were competitive, and they took them from people who trained in American medical schools. Um, and it was a good first posting. It was a way to get experience, um, to get out west, have some adventure. Most of the forts in 1840s, 1850s America were out on the frontier where the Indians were and where those battles were. Um, and then you have this, ex this huge expansion for the Civil War, but then it collapses back again. So there were too many doctors in the Army at that point. They decommissioned most of them. Um, the next real expansion comes 33 years later with the Spanish-American War. So there, there was not really, I mean, they were back on the post on the frontier fighting the Indians. You know, there was not this sense that the Army needs doctors to be trained in their own medicine. So um, I don't know. Does anybody know when the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences is founded? I'm, I'm going to say after World War II. Um, you know, most, most universities had, like the ROTC programs, like Virginia Tech and all that. You, had, you, know, you were either an Army cadet or a Navy cadet in school. And if you look at the class pictures, I think John and I have talked about this, the class pictures, they're all wearing uniforms. Yeah. Yeah. Class pictures win. Like a, of the universities. Okay. You know, up until, uh, I'm, I'm sure up until the 60s, right? Or maybe later. Well, so the Reserve Officer Training Corps, um, I'm not sure when it started as a, as a plan. And the, the plan, obviously, is the Army will pay your tuition and you'll owe the Army or the Navy or whoever two years or three years or whatever it was. There certainly were military schools. The Citadel was there from 1830 or so, something like that. VMI. VMI, okay. I stayed in the original Citadel. You can see it's an embassy suites now. It's really cool. But <laughs> anyway, the, but when... They, they didn't specifically train doctors, I'm going to guess, until after World War II, as doctors, as a doctor medical school. They could have been a ROTC person, and, and my guess is the first stage was that someone goes into the military and becomes a medic or something, and then announces that he wants to be a doctor, and the Army sends him for that. But um, I know, for example, in the Korean War, my father was a dentist. He graduated from UT Dental School in 1852, and, and a lot of his classmates had the choice. You can go in, you can get drafted to Korea, or you can go into the reserves and be a dentist um, and do that for your service. And so everybody, you know, that's, it was a way to do your internship and uh, get your military service done at the same time. But the the, the Navy, in his case, had not
put him through dental school. They just relieved him of getting drafted, you know. So I'm not exactly sure the history of that. I know someone who knows, but he's not here right now. <laughs> There's a small college in Southwest Virginia called Emory and Henry College. Right. It was founded in 1836. Okay. And I know that um, they turned part of the campus facilities into a Civil War hospital uh, at one time. Mm -hmm. I have some papers on it, but I can't quote anything. Was that a fairly common thing when there was not a regional hospital uh, nearby that they would commandeer facilities like that and form hospitals? Yes, I mean, the, I've said several things about these papers for the hospital in Columbia, South Carolina. They were in the University of South Carolina's buildings. Um, and already in 1864, the president of the University of South Carolina was sort of, excuse me, we'd like our, <laughs> our building back. You know, I guess not a strong patriotic fervor there. Um, so yes, they did that. They took girls' schools. They took um, whatever they could get particularly places that had dormitories or had that kind of layout of regular rooms that they could fill up in the South. And because it was suboptimal, it wasn't the nice pavilion, you know, with everything designed, but it's what they could do. Um, so yes, they did. Now they didn't always, like the James River Peninsula was a place that needed hospitals through the whole war, uh, just as Richmond did. Um, Whereas uh, uh, Columbia, South Carolina might have been a place that was convenient at some parts of the war, but not others um, as the war moved around. They didn't, for example, have hospitals at the fairgrounds in Atlanta until, you know, 1864. Uh, so Sherman rearranged things, as you can probably imagine. I was just going to speak to the question about a military professionalism in medicine. Okay. I graduated from USIS, so USIS oh, okay. opened in the 1970s. Thank you. And military Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences, the military yes, medical school. Our national military medical opened school. Opened in the 1970s. Thank you. Okay. Yes, and physicians didn't receive rank in the services until after the Spanish-American War. So until then, they were just consultants who were working alongside. No. The, uh, the surgeons in the Civil War, if you were a full surgeon, you were commissioned a major in the Army, um, and assistant surgeons were something less. Captain, yeah. So that was a huge difference because there were also contract surgeons, and they would hire the local docs to be contract surgeons maybe for a month, say the doctors around Gettysburg, because the commission people got pensions and all the rest of it. So now that may have changed by the Spanish-American War. I don't know. But they were in the Civil War. They were officers, just so you know. <laughs> but thank you for that. I figured it was fairly recent. The buildings are all shiny white and everything. <laughs> on, did, on the, uh, did, did you work with Dale Smith or Robert Joy there? So I worked with Dale Smith. I got my master's of public health there. And mm -hmm. then I studied um, Army medical history down at the AMED Center and school in San Antonio under the okay. senior historian there. Yeah, to the question of the, the officers, uh, presumably those would be volunteer commissions, though, not regular Army commissions that the surgeons would have gotten. Because even high-ranking generals still would often have low ranks in the, the regular Army. And but would receive temporary high rank volunteer commission. So you may both be right that they did okay. not uh, commission regular army officers for that. Uh, my question was uh, about a story that I have heard many times and assume may be apocryphal. So I'm curious about your, your take on it, about the use of uh, substitutes for surgical thread in the Confederacy, um, in particular horsehair, and the, the practice of trying to render it more pliant by boiling it and then mm -hmm. discovering that inadvertently, not knowing why, they had a much better recovery rate. I've heard that story too. I don't know, I don't know anything about it. I can't contribute. Somebody, I would, 
I gave this talk last week in uh, Spartanburg, South Carolina, and somebody asked me exactly the same question. So it must be in somebody's book or someplace. It's out there. It's out there. So it could be. There are um, two s types of suturing needles in, or I'm sorry, suturing thread in the exhibit, horsehair and catgut. And I'd read in, uh, I think, at least two books that they would boil the horsehair, which would make it inadvertently sterile, which they didn't know and didn't really care about that. Um, but that's what they would do to make sure that they could weave it through the skin. But that's what, at least what I read. I'm not sure, I mean, if you think about modern sterile suture material, you've got the package and it's attached to the little hooked needle and you've got your, your sterile gloves on and your sterile forceps and you pull it out or your needle holder. And if it lies on the patient at all, it's lying on that sterile blue drape. But this horsehair that's been boiled would then be handled by the hands of those surgeons we saw in that picture. So that makes a nice story, but I'm not sure it would have made that much difference. It might have held better than um, silk, as I understand it was. And it still wicks. Yeah. It still wicks what's ever on the surface. No. So I, surgical techniques, there's, there's a fellow at Duke named Justin Barr. Get him over here. The, uh, <laughs> he, he is a historian of surgery um, and an MD, PhD uh, as well, and is doing a surgical rotation or surgical residency at Duke, so he could answer much more of this conversation. His research is actually on vascular surgery, you know, how army surgeons learn to sew blood vessels back together, for example, trying to save legs or whatnot and how that technology moved to the civilian sphere and finally ends up being bypass surgery on hearts. But uh, anyway, he's a great speaker. Highly recommend it. <laughs> yeah, I had a quick one. Uh, was the U.S. Navy's statistics involved in the ones you showed, or is that, were they separate, or were they, it's all the same statistic? And uh, can you comment on what their help was compared to, say, the, the Army in general? <sighs> I don't know. There were a few black troops on ships, um, but how their health was, I just, I can't tell you. I think they are part of those general statistics, but I'm, that may be all army. What do you think, Book? I don't know. <laughs> the Navy was very small in, in that time period. Speaking to your your question about the sailors, black sailors, and about 10% of the serv the black the uh, maritime service was was black uh, uh, as well, um, and the the problem I, I've never looked specifically at the data, but um, if you think of it from the perspective of what jobs they would be doing aboard ship, um, the yeah, their health wouldn't be the greatest. However you're still being treated by the same surgeon on board ship and you there would be somewhat of sim general mm. s similar medical care but yeah they were depending on where they were serving depending on their blockade runners versus the monitors that sort of thing there uh, yeah there it was their service um so yeah that that would be my input there i didn't think that the same surgeon would be working on everybody uh, I, I hadn't considered that the, the same surgeon would have worked on whatever population, whatever minority would be on the boat, so that's interesting. Yeah. Anybody else? If not, thank you very much. And I'm glad to answer individual questions if people We have. also have the index to this.